So in principle, we could use dot plots to characterize protein structure too. This is a real one uh, of hemoglobin alpha versus hemoglobin beta chains. So here you see some very long lines along the diagonal and then lots of smaller lines that are more or less random matches. The problem is that it's hard to quantify this because it's binary, it's all or nothing. Either we have a match and then it's a dot or it's close but no match and then it's nothing. So nobody uses this for proteins anymore, only DNA structure. Let's look at some real structures. I think this is myoglobin. Um, Hue is for human, and uh, then we have some sperm whale. DG is dog whale. W whale, that's sperm whale. PN is pony, I think, etc. Do you see the patterns here? There are lots of positions here where we have exactly the same residue in all these species, and then there are a handful of positions where they're slightly different. You might even have some insertions here. I'm not sure whether there is one. We could try to calculate some sort of average or at least consensus, because if I demand that I can only, if I should say that I only assign an average if it's exactly the same residue, well, as the number of species grows, remember that there could be hundreds of thousands, at some point I will never ever have any position where every single species have the same residue. So I'm going to need to make do with say that, you know, if 90% of them are alanine, I'm going to say that it is an alanine and allow a little bit of change. And that's particularly why the dot plots are not very good. Second, not all changes here are equal, right? If I change something that's small and hydrophobic for something else that's small and hydrophobic, you probably agree that that's not likely to change the protein structure a lot. But if we change small and hydrophobic to something large and charged, that's going to be a very large change. So one way or another, we're going to need to find a way to characterize and calculate these changes and see how important they are and ideally be able to go from these structures and predict what the sequence, what the, from these sequences and predict what the structure is. Because remember, all of these sequences have the same structure. How do we do that? Well, if I plot just a small fake sequence here, uh, do you see the similarities here? There are some things that are similar, but it's not entirely easy. So if we go there and if I insert a little bit of gap in one of them here, now I get C, K, F lining up. So first I have the C there, that's a match. There are more matches, but I won't show all of them. Then I have this gap or insertion. So it's a gap in one sequence, it's an insertion in the other sequence. That can happen. And then I have things that are mismatches. Um, in theory, I could, instead of a mismatch, I could first introduce a gap in one sequence and then a gap in the other sequence. But it's unlikely that evolution worked that way, that it kept inserting gaps. It was probably rather that I changed an alanine for a glycine. Both of them are fairly small and similar residues. So I would like to find a way to somehow, rather than saying that this looks good and I did this manually, find a way to let the computer do this and assign a score to it. So we're going to need a way to calculate sequence similarity and in particular score it. How do we do that? Well, if I just had that example alignments of myoglobin with different sequences, we can calculate that. It's not particularly difficult and it's the way to do this goes beyond the class again, but just to show you that this is not something magic we're lining up. I can calculate what is the probability of matching say an alanine to a glycine. Let's say that's 0.1. And then I can say, what is the probability of matching an alanine to an alanine? That's probably much larger, uh, rather. This should be 0.01, and this should probably be 0.9. And then what is the probability of matching an alanine with, say, with a tryptophan? That should probably be pretty low, say, etc. If I do that, the probability of matching everything, that should be the probability of matching impulse 1 multiplied by the probability of matching impulse 2 multiplied by the probability of the match impulse 3 multiplied by the probability of matching impulse etc. all the way up. The problem is that first we need to multiply things a lot uh, and multiplications can be a bit expensive on computers, not that bad anymore. But in particular, when these numbers are small, we can actually end up with underflow. If once we get to 10 to the minus 30 or so, computers can no longer calculate. So in practice, what we typically do is that I introduce a score where I say that S is 
a logarithm of the probability. And by probability here, I can literally, these probabilities literally just come from counting. Uh, how common is it that an alanine is replaced for a glycine versus not? In that case, I get that S dot equals S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4, etc. So I literally get score numbers that I can add up. And this is the entire basis of bioinformatics. But just know that we could actually derive this from probabilities. It's nothing magic. So the idea with those scores is that I can look at small fragments of pre-existing residues that I know match and then use those to derive scores. How common is it I replace alanine for tryptophan? That leads to so-called substitution scoring matrices, substitution matrices or scoring matrices, which is literally matrices with all the amino acids on row and columns and then scores. There are some extra letters here, and this is just to uh, tell you what they are. But in some cases, it can be difficult to tell asparagine for aspar aspartic acid. What this gives us is a way to introduce more biological information, right? Remember, rather than just looking at residues and guessing whether alanine is more stable and loose in here, this is derived from how frequently does nature in practice replace alanine with leucine. So in a way, I'm relying more on evolution. Or am I? Yes, I am, but evolution also encodes the physics, right? The reason why alanine is reasonably easy to replace, say, with glycine, is the physics we talked about in the first few lectures of this class. And the reason why it's less likely to be replaced, say, with tryptophan is, of course, also the physics. But here, instead of looking at the physics, I cheat and let nature do the physics for me, and I just look at the outcome. Apparently, in practice, nature tends not to replace tryptophan with other residues so much. Who am I to question nature's judgment? If nature does that, I will just trust nature, and I will use those rules when I try to identify similar proteins. So the ultimate information is the same. I just choose different ways to approach it. That's going to be a theme we come back to. Virtually every single significant advance in predicting structures and understanding things in bioinformatics has come from introducing more biology, not necessarily fancier algorithms.